principal issue I'm going to deal with is how to communicate uh, this concept of uh, the value of aging science, geroscience, or the longevity dividend. And, and I'm not saying that the way in which I'm going to do this is the best uh, way of doing it. I don't know what the best way of doing it is. I'm just telling you how I do it. Uh, and I've been addressing this issue way back since 1990 um, under uh, you know general concepts of modulating aging and then under the longevity dividend banner since 2006 when we published our article on this topic. Um, so uh, these are sort of the sub areas I'll be talking about the law of mortality, the logic behind the longevity dividend or gero science, um, Faust's longevity bargain, and FDA and Congress validation and economic benefits, which actually closely relates to the previous um, presentation. So, uh, and what you're gonna get here, by the way, is an extremely abridged version of this logic and line of reasoning. There's only so much you can do in about 20 minutes. Um, so it does take a little bit longer, but I'll, I'll do my best to do an abridged version um, and move through the arguments fairly quickly. So um, going back to 1825, uh, Benjamin Gompertz was an actuary who was looking at the relationship between age and the risk of, of, uh, of dying and discovered uh, this line here, which is a, it's a, on a semi-log scale. So a straight line means an exponential increase in the risk of death. And he basically quantified uh, the timing of death in humans and concluded uh, in his time period, that this was a law of mortality. This was the actual language that, that he used. And when he saw this as a law of mortality, he viewed it pretty much as universal as an equivalent to uh, Newton's law of, of gravity. In other words, the belief was, was that it was immutable. It was unchangeable. And that view of the immu uh, immutability of the mortality schedule for humans or aging uh, actually held up until fairly recently, until the last uh, decade or so. There's still some people who believe that it's not possible to modulate aging, but it is. This is one of the reasons why, by the way. Um, this is what death rates look like, um, looked like in 1825. This is what they've looked like um, right up until the present. And basically the age trajectory of death itself has not changed in humans. It's all, the mortality rate doubling time has always been about somewhere between seven to eight years. And even to today, that doubling time has not really uh, changed at all. The risk of death has gone down, but the doubling uh, has not changed. And of course, what we're trying to do in the world of aging science and aging biology is modulate or slow down the biological rate of aging, which would be reflected in a change in the slope of the mortality curve. And that's what I think we're uh, in the end, we're trying uh, to accomplish. It doesn't just apply to humans. Uh, the law of mortality that Gompertz was talking about applies to a broad range of sexually reproducing species. And that was one of the reasons why there, it was thought to be a, a you know this immutable constant law that linked up the timing of reproduction to, um, to, to duration of life. So way back when, this was uh, right about the time our book came out, uh, The Quest for Immortality, we published, my colleagues and I published this article in Scientific American entitled, If Humans Were Built to Last. And we were basically making the argument that the human body um, wasn't designed for long-term use. In fact, it wasn't, there is no designer. There was no design uh, plan uh, that existed. And so we have to live with this particular set of, uh, of um genetic byproducts uh, that we inherited from our ancestors. So the things that go wrong with us are pretty common. Uh, it's not anything we don't know about, loss of muscle mass, uh, you know, bone density, inability to transport air or fluids through the body. I mean, these are the main things that, that go wrong with us, uh, you know, problems with joints and eyes and ears. And um, these changes are inevitable. There's a lot of variation that exists, but the, for the most part, the argument we were making in this paper was um, we have to live with this particular uh, design that, uh, that we have, and this design doesn't allow for, uh, for long-term use. So if we're going to make us live healthier longer, uh, we're not going to be manipulating the genome anytime soon. We're going to actually have to 
uh, alter the way in which this body operates and manipulating aging, we think is probably one of the most innovative and classic ways in which you can influence all of these things at once. This was the uh, final image that we came up with in that article. Um, and the whole point here was not that we can design any better um, than mother nature uh, designed, but that we really need to rethink uh, the whole concept of aging and aging science and aging biology itself uh, to realize that we have to live within the limits of these uh, bodies that we inherited. And uh, there are ways in which we can man manipulate the operation of these bodies so that they last longer. And in the end, that's what aging science is, um, is all about. So let me explain to you the way in which I try to explain this to people that aren't familiar with the concept of aging science and aging biology. Um, and I use uh, the story of Faust as a classic example of how to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And this is uh, Goethe's uh, Faust. So if you don't, if you know the story of Faust, um, it's an individual uh, from, uh, you know, from this story from a couple of hundred years ago. Faust was disillusioned with his own limits. Uh, he turned to suicide. He uh, was eventually approached by the devil, Mephistopheles, who made him an offer. In exchange for his soul, uh, he would get unlimited knowledge and continuous youthful vigor. Um, and Faust, uh, you know, the story of Faust is a metaphor. You've seen lots of movies and stories about Faustian bargains where uh, it seems like it's a good deal at the beginning, but it ends up being a pretty bad deal um, at the end. Well, if you consider the uh, human longevity revolution, the first revolution that occurred beginning about 1850, you know, Mephistopheles came to humanity about 1850, said, I've got a deal for you. I'm going to reduce infant, child, and maternal mortality um, pretty dramatically. It's been one of the major causes of death. It led to a very low life expectancy of about 30. Um, I'm going to allow all of you to live or most of you to live past the age of 65. Um, and, you know, humanity signed the papers. It was a good deal. Um, we saved our children. We got to live decades longer. We added about, uh, uh, let's see, if life expectancy at the time was, was probably about 50, we added about 30 years to life expectancy up to about 80 uh, today. Uh, but the price we had to pay was the rise of many of the diseases and disorders associated with growing older, heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, um, fatal and disabling conditions, and of course, an insatiable thirst for more longevity. Um, well, as it turns out, uh, Mephistopheles has come to humanity again and said, I've got another deal for you. And here's the deal. Um, I'm going to reduce the risk of death from the major causes that I gave you as a result of the first deal uh, that you signed in 1850, um, you will get incrementally smaller gains in, in, in longevity. It won't be quite as large as what we saw um, in the early part of the 20th century, um, but you'll get more people um, surviving into old age. Uh, unfortunately, the price we would have to pay for this particular offer that Mephistopheles is offering us now, and by the way, if it isn't obvious, the Mephistopheles offer is the current medical model, which is basically attacking one disease at a time as if they're all independent of each other. The price we would have to pay if we succeeded in curing major fatal diseases today would in all likelihood be a pretty dramatic increase in the uh, uh, onset and severity of Alzheimer's disease and other neurological conditions as a result of uh, of this extended survival. And so I've argued that we should not sign the papers. Uh, this is a bad deal. And in fact, um, we should be pursuing something else. We should really be trying to pursue the next great uh, method of improving public health, which is to slow or influence the basic biological rate of aging. Now I encapsulated this whole concept in a single image uh, that I published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, back in 2018, uh, where I basically show a survival distribution for females in the United States in 1900, that's the black line, and uh, females in 2016, illustrating exactly what the first longevity revolution was all about, 
which is a pretty dramatic reduction in early onset uh, mortality. We redistributed death from the young to the old, and we, we created this, this blue line of survival, uh, which is really what you see in almost all developed countries today. It looks almost exactly like this, uh, but it's placed against the backdrop of frailty and disability or an area that I refer to as the red zone. When frailty and disability rise pretty rapidly, and uh, this is where the real danger lies, is that if people make it out into the red zone without either their mind or their body intact, that's when you run into severe difficulties um, with, uh, with healthcare costs and uh, you know, just in general being unhappy about surviving to extreme old age if you've lost either um, uh, your mind or your body. And so um, what I've argued is, and what, what I believe aging science is all about is not trying to push out the blue line any longer, but instead trying to compress the red zone, to push out the red zone to a later and later age so that we could retain our youthful vigor for a longer and longer time period. We probably will live longer as a result. I don't know by how much. I don't think anyone really does uh, know by how much. It's an uh, untestable hypothesis on how much longer life expectancy would be if we succeed in slowing aging. But I do think that we will see fairly quickly some changes in healthy life expectancy as uh, aging interventions come online. So um, as it turns out, um, and this is another image that I like to use to convey this message. Um, the image on the left is called the Bridge of Life that was actually commissioned by Carl Pearson in the late uh, 19th century, uh, showing basically the, uh, what the timing of death looks like um, in humans and the risk of death as a function of age. And so the bridge of life on the left side illustrates the very low mortality that exists early. Or I'm sorry, the very high mortality that exists very early. The point of lowest mortality is always right at or about puberty. And then the risk of death rises exponentially. You could see that even Carl Pearson uh, indicated back in 1897 that he didn't think that we were gonna live a whole lot longer um, than individuals that made it out to extreme old age by the um, what you see as sort of an abrupt end to that uh, bridge. Now, what geroscience is all about, in my view, um, is, is uh, not necessarily trying to create an additional scaffolding at the end, but really trying to allow more and more people to make it out to older ages with their health intact, which is the image that I have on the right as sort of a uh, you know, if you're looking at that bridge on the left side from the top, uh, each one of those holes would represent a risk, let's say heart disease or cancer or stroke, and the older you get, the higher the risk. Um, and this phenomenon of uh, experiencing these mortality risks closer and closer together in epidemiology is called competing risks. So the longer you live, the higher the probability that you're going to run across one of these other risks fairly quickly and a cure for any one of them actually isn't gonna have much of an effect on longevity because all these other risks remain. And these risks, of course, are associated with the basic biological process of aging. So uh, the whole concept of geroscience uh, or the longevity dividend is to really push back, compress, sh um, uh, make smaller or eliminate those holes that exist on the bridge. So you can make it out to older and older ages with. Uh, your health intact. It's as you could tell, I'm a right brain thinker. I like to use imagery to convey these um, messages. So here's the entire line of reasoning uh, in a nutshell um, that I use. And again, this is a greatly abbreviated version of the logic behind uh, geroscience or the longevity dividend. So I'm going to take you all the way back uh, to evolution, to first principles from evolutionary biology, um, pointing out that the timing of reproduction of species, sexually reproducing species is calibrated to hostility in the environment. Each species has developed fixed genetic programs for growth, development, and reproduction, uh, and a, a set of life histories. Um, and that's the immutability argument, um, I think that essentially Gompertz was making and that we were making in a way with our sci uh, Scientific American article. Um, and then this is sort of the basic logic and the rationale for why we live as long as we do. And, and that is duration of life of humans and other re, uh, sexually reproducing species is calibrated to the onset and length of that reproductive window is limited by body design. 
So we have to recognize that there are limits that exist in these bodies. And the only way to get around that is to break through that glass ceiling, which is what geroscience is all about. Um, so we see aging or senescence as an inadvertent byproduct of fixed genetic programs. It, I know some people make the argument that, that aging or senescence is, um, is based on a genetic program. I don't believe that there is evidence to support that. It's an accident or an inadvertent byproduct um, of fixed genetic programs for other um, developmental aspects of the species. In long-lived populations like uh, uh, you know, developed countries uh, for humans, uh, aging becomes the most important risk factor uh, for the diseases that we see at older ages. If life extension is caused only by disease reduction, this exposes the saved pop population to an elevated risk of aging become an, becoming an ever more powerful risk factor. That's the closeness of all of those holes in the bridge that I showed you earlier. So if you don't influence all of them at once, you don't really gain uh, uh, very much, and certainly in terms of life extension, uh, but you also run into issues of health extension. Uh, because death is a zero sum game, when one death declines, um, something else must rise. So in the end, it's a game of whack-a-mole and it's all about uh, the trade-offs. And I would argue that uh, if we don't pursue this effort to modulate aging, if we don't pursue gero science and we don't pursue uh, this longevity dividend initiative concept, that we are not going to like what we see. As a result, uh, pushing people out into the red zone without compressing that red zone is going to create a scenario that I think is exactly what um, you know Mephistopheles um, is anticipating that we don't want to see. So a new paradigm in public health is required. That's what we're talking about here. That's what all of geroscience is all about, is a new paradigm uh, in public health. And we're basically arguing that geroscience is, in my view, in our view, the most effective method of primary prevention of all fatal and disabling diseases that exist today. Uh, very good descriptions, I think, in Felipe Sierra and Ron Kohansky's book uh, on advances in geroscience. There's a, another description in our book, uh, Aging the Longevity Dividend, and I'm pleased to say that uh, the next version of this book is coming out in the fall. Actually, I'm also pleased to say that Keith has a very nice chapter um, in this book. So here's um, part of the line of reasoning um, that others uh, have used, which I, I do like to, sh to show this because I come from a, a, an epidemiology program where the epidemiologists in our School of Public Health will often show a figure that looks very, like, very much like this on what the major diseases and disorders are and the risk factors for the things that go wrong with us. Um, and these are the risk factors uh, for heart disease that you see in an epidemiology program when in fact aging dwarfs them all in terms of relevance. These are the risk factors associated with cancer that are taught in schools of epidemiology. We know in the world of aging science that aging is the primary risk factor for almost all forms of cancer. It can be influenced by other risk factors for, uh, for sure. Uh, same thing with Alzheimer's disease. These are the risk factors that we learn about in, in school, uh, but in fact, aging dwarfs them all in terms of relevance for Alzheimer's uh, disease. We first described this argument in this line of reasoning in this paper in 2006. My co-authors were Dan Perry, Rich Miller, and uh, Bob Butler, uh, where we described the longevity dividend. The basic logic and line of reasoning has not changed uh, at all. And this is, in my view, ex this is geroscience. It's exactly what uh, geroscience is all about. So let me be clear, um, the FDA is on our side. The FDA has already agreed that uh, we can target aging um, with interventions. So uh, contrary to some views that some people hold that the F we have to convince the FDA, we don't have to convince them. We've already done it. Um, and in fact, the FDA was, was bending over backwards to offer suggestions on how to help us um, and I can also uh, tell you that the American Federation for Aging Research just met with members of Congress and they have already included language in the next appropriations um, bill to support uh, aging science through the National Institute on Aging. So we have already succeeded in a, in a huge way 
um, both through Congress, through the FDA, um, through uh, hopefully additional funding at the National Institute on Aging. And then the economic argument is just such an easy one uh, to make in terms of the amount of money that would be saved just with a sl small slowdown in the rate of biological aging. I don't really have time uh, to, to get into that, but I'll, I'll end with this picture and just say that there's no need for any of us to embellish the story, exaggerate, come up with, you know, estimates of life expectancy that are that are you know extremely high and unsupported by scientific evidence. We don't have to do that. Um, the science and the logic and the rationale behind geroscience and the longevity dividend is an easy story to tell, well supported by science. Um, and I'm just giving you one example of the way in which I tell it, and, and I've heard you know Jim Kirkland and Nir Barzilai tell the story their way, and I love the way they tell the story. But there's many ways in which we can tell this story and convince uh, the world of science and the general public on the value of what we're doing. Mm -hmm.